Oral Tradition Archives presents We Have No Word for Sex, an Indigenous View of Intimacy, with Maladoma and Sabonfu Somme. Recorded live at the Julia Morgan Theater in Berkeley, California, on May 15, 1994. Introducing Maladoma and Sabonfu are author Alice Walker and storyteller Michael Mead. It is an honor to be here tonight to introduce and to welcome to our community Subanfu and Maladoma Somme. These are teachers who I think can help us put together so many things that um, our modern Western world has broken. I get a lot of books in the mail from people. And I love to read, but I'm also often very tired, and I don't really feel like reading. So I had a stack of books in my house, and I was about to go somewhere where I hoped to just not read a single word for a long time. But I looked through the books anyway, because you know how books are, they wave. And I came to Of Water and the Spirit and Maladoma's photograph. And it was the expression in his eyes that made me feel like, well, maybe I'll take this one book. Um, and I took it, and I started reading it. But what I really think was happening is another little story that goes with this, and that is that even though I am often accused of you know, beating up on black men and not liking them. One of the early loves of my life is my grandfather. <clears throat> so when I was reading Maladoma, and he talks and tells in this book about his relationship as a four and five-year-old and earlier with his grandfather, I recognized in his grandfather, my grandfather. And it so moved me that I, I cannot even express what it felt like to see my grandfather uh, in his grandfather. And so I felt that when I looked at his photograph and looked into his eyes in the photograph, it was actually his grandfather speaking to me. And that was the sense that I carried as I read this really magical, wonderful book. It's, it's not really... It's hard even to think of it as a book, you know. It's, it's more like something that grew. And it has introduced me to knowledge that I feel I already had, but I needed someone to access it for me, to help me to get it again. And this is a quality of his teaching that I think is very rare and very beautiful and very special. I think that what these teachers have to tell us is probably very odd to us. It will be sometimes very strange. But that is because, it seems to me, uh, it is like all the other things in creation that are truly themselves. You know, all natural things really are strange and odd, as beautiful, too, as they are. So. I'm really delighted that you are here and that I'm here and that we will be learning together tonight from these teachers. And I'm delighted that they have come to share the Dagara way with us. I also want to extend a welcome and say it's always a pleasure to be back in Berkeley, in the Bay Area. And I want to say it's also a pleasure and an honor to be on the stage with Alice Walker, whose work has been revelatory for so many people in this country and in other countries. Thank you for coming. Thank you for giving so much you've given. And I want to uh, specifically introduce you a little bit to Sabon Fu, perhaps by way of two little stories about her one that I uh, read and she told me some about, which is that uh, at the age of five, some spiritual 
events happened to her which made her stand out from those around her and began her training as a keeper of the rituals. The idea being that whoever is struck or grabbed by the spirit has to learn the containment and the dance of that spirit by learning the way of rituals. And so her name means keeper of the rituals. The other part of that is amongst the Dagara, you are born into one of five elemental groups and her group is the nature group. She's born from nature. She's born of nature. And what that means encapsulated is that she is a being of transformation and change. You will see that when she's here. It's undeniable. And it is also something you cannot stop. Uh, I advise you not to try. Uh, the nature people are given the permission to tell the truth. So that's part of her role. And uh, just a little local story. We were doing a reading at a local bookstore, um, which we never read anything because we were drumming and singing, mostly. And so Bonfu immediately goes amongst everybody there saying, come on, come on, dance. And there were two people who wouldn't move from their chair and they said, we can't dance, we're sick. And she said, you're very wrong. You have to dance because you are sick. <laughs> and uh, she, I think she added something like, if you don't dance, you'll be dead. So, <laughs> so, so that is her, her way. And if you imagine that perhaps the single most lethal omission in modern culture is the omission of meaningful ritual. When it is said that she's a keeper of the ritual, she is indeed someone that has brought a deeply needed and meaningful teaching to the West. And so I ask you to kind of watch the nature of the ritual mind when she speaks and when she acts. Sabonfu and Maradoma. Jesus, now what are we going to talk about? <laughs> we, just, we just arrived from, uh, from Minneapolis and uh, rested a little bit. And we sat down there trying to figure out what we're going to talk about. And uh, Shabonfo asked me, what is the meaning of sex in English? <laughs> Well, first I tried to, uh, to give the dictionary definition. But then I realized that no, I got to go somewhere else to figure that out. So I moved into French. And I realized that it's the same word in French. So I went into Dagara to try to figure it out. And I realized we don't have a word for sex. So she, she helped me understand that, uh, well, we're dealing with something that is problematic. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully uh, she's going to tell you why, because I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, that'll help us take it from there to find out why it is here, why there's sex here and uh, something else there. And maybe uh, uh, if we can meet somewhere in the middle, we'll get the chance perhaps to add a few more words to this uh, three letters thing that is so problematic. So the Dagara people are, for those who've got a little bit of geographic confusion, they're located somewhere in the center of West Africa. Some of the countries you may be thinking about in reference to uh, Dagara people should be Ghana, uh, uh, Ivory Coast, uh, Togo, you know, all these coastal countries. Right sitting on top of that is a country that is called Burkina Faso, formerly referred to by the uh, colonial establishment as Upper Volta. In 1984, the government of that time decided that uh, those borrowed names were too troublesome. So they decided to reassign a new name to the country, which now means uh, the land of the proud ancestors. When uh, in 1882, uh, Europe was sitting in Belgium trying to figure out how to share this big land of Africa. Uh, they ended up dividing the Dagara tribe into three different nationalities. There are a few hundred thousand in Burkina Faso. They call it the French area. There are another few hundred thousand in, the, in Ghana. 
and there are a smaller number in the Ivory Coast. This division occurred uh, as a result of the notoriously ar arbitrary nature of colonialism. They didn't like to take into account the fact that uh, tribal community referred to themselves as nations by themselves. So these are the Dagora people, who they are uh, socially or uh, communally is probably not that different from what you've heard about indigenous communities elsewhere. Maybe what should be mentioned is the fact that, uh, well, they don't have the, uh, the amenities that we have here, like uh, light coming from nowhere and uh, uh, water coming out of a faucet. They don't live in uh, houses without cockroaches or, or things of that sort. But uh, they're very close to the earth, uh, close to nature. And that is the gift that we, we received uh, from such an environment, from such a place. In this situation where life is directly inspired by the earth, by the trees, by the hills, by the rivers, the kind of relationship that exists in uh, nature, uh, the kind of relationship that exists on the earth, prior to uh, the village coming into it is directly translated in some subtle ways in the building of the community and uh, determines the kind of relationship that exists between people. The whole concept of the intimate is primarily deriving from, from ritual. Outside of ritual, nothing can be truly intimate, which is the reason why every feeling is ritualistically understood. So human relationships, when they begin to deepen, borrow or enter into the canal of ritual, so the closest relationship is a relationship that is constantly happening as a ritual. Now, you may begin to guess where we're heading toward. It is uh, a very complex, but nonetheless very serious point, which is something that just hit me this afternoon when uh, uh, Shabonfa mentioned the fact, uh, asked me what sex is about in English, which I didn't know. So, uh, the point I want to mention is the fact that Relationship, in other words, anything close, anything intimate, is impossible without a ritual space. Anything that brings people into expressing to one another something other than uh, the normal day-to-day -day life, for instance, how to plow uh, the field, how to, how to plant uh, millet, or how to dig yam. Anything other than that is touching on the spiritual world, on the, on the ancestral world, and therefore is a ritual going on. This determines, of course, everything else that's happened. The way people are looked at. Michael Mead was mentioning uh, the whole idea of nature in association with Subanfo. Your essence determines the kind of ritual space or the kind of intimacy that you are going to assume with another person or with yourself and so forth. And therefore, failure to, to stay close to your nature as a, a, a dysfunctional intimacy with your true nature translates into a dysfunctional relationship with the rest of the village or with the rest of the people around you. So when something does not work socially with you, that is to say, when this ritual space breaks away in you, what happens is that people look at that as a sign that somehow in the spirit world, some ties have been uh, cut. Uh, do you follow <laughs> Good. Uh, so uh, this is why, this is what explained that I was here 
when I received a letter from the, from the village telling me that as of a few months prior to the date I received the letter that I was to consider myself married. <laughs> I didn't know that uh, this was who uh, I had been married to. Uh, that was about five years ago. Of course, uh, later on I went back there, uh, was introduced to her, or I don't know, maybe she was introduced to me. Yeah. You were introduced to me. <laughs> oh, talk about that. You want to, you want to, you want to say something that you say? I had got just uh, completed the full cycle of uh, initiation when I was called into the circle of the elders. And uh, I was quite surprised. But when I got there, they said, well, we have this son who lives in the West. And we need somebody who can keep him company. So I said, what does that have to do with me? <laughs> and the response I got was, you see, you, you are the kind of person who can get along with him. And I said, well, isn't it anybody else in the village who can get along with him? <laughs> Well, we've been working on that. <laughs> they were quite confused. They didn't know what to tell me, except that uh, the only thing they could tell me was, your life purpose is uh, on the same uh, road as his. And so what we're trying to do here is not to force you to marry somebody, because we know that being far away from home is very difficult. If he was somewhere around here, we wouldn't have even called you here. We would have made things and you would have been notified. And uh, so I said, hmm, so how am I going to live far away and be able to survive without my family and without everybody here? And they said, you are going to be taken care of. You just need to give us your yes and then everything would be fine. And uh, I said, well, I can't give you my answer right now because I don't know what I'm dealing with. So I said, well, you have um, some time. Go back and think about it and come back and tell us what you think. So I went and spent three months. And during the three months I spent, I went to my parents and said, what do you think I should do? They said, no, 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 we are too attached to this issue to give you a good advice, so we can't give you any advice. And so I went around for months. My grandmother has just passed away, and she was like my main counselor. So I went to uh, my other grandmothers, and they said uh, that they were too attached to to give me uh, any kind of advice. And so I spent uh, some time around my grandmother's uh, uh, grave. One night as I was, stand, I was sitting on the grave, this voice came to me and said, don't worry, just say yes, and you'll see that everything will be fine. And so the next day I woke up and I went to the elders and I said, yes. And they were quite relieved and said, okay, we'll start everything and uh, the wedding will be on its way. And I didn't know Mali Doma, but I knew his family. He was the only person in the family I didn't know. And uh, of course, the wedding came. Since in the village, you do not need to be at your wedding. Mali Doma wasn't there, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I would have liked to. Be. <laughs> Well, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> so anyway, um, a year or so later, he came home, and uh, we were to meet. And we were introduced as a couple, and we didn't know each other. We were like, well, what do we do now? <laughs> One of the things that I had learned from the elders was how to uh, create a sacred uh, space and how to build an intimate relationship in that space. As uh, uh, Malidoma and I spent time together, we started to work on uh, these issues. 
And by the way, in the village, women and men do not sleep together. Uh, women sleep in their quarter and men sleep in their quarter and that is because in order to bring uh, their strength out of this uh, society they need to empower each other, they need to bring <laughs> they need to bring each other best out so that whenever you, are, you go out and you meet with a man, there isn't an imbalance that is created. When Malidoma came home, I was uh, sleeping with his mother. We, we used to share the same bed. And uh, he used to ask, when are we going to meet? I said, you don't need to worry about that. We'll find a way to meet. No, I used to say, when are we going to bed? <laughs> <laughs> and so, anyway. <laughs> As uh, any, any person in the village, you manage to meet somewhere and you create this, a secret space. And the way you create it in the village is just by using ash and by making a circle. In the circle, you bring a calabash full of water and you put it in the middle of a circle. Uh, whoever started will sit and wait for the next person to, to come. When the next person gets there, then you do an invocation and uh, you invoke the spirit. And as you, you do that, there is something inside that automatically unlocks itself. And Malidoma and I being like strangers to us, but each time we meet in such a uh, space, it's like we have known each other forever. And there are information that we we thought that the other person did not know about uh, you, that you know, the person says, oh, this, and you say, how did you know that? As we stay home, you don't need to ask this kind of question. It's something that uh, you have shared over and over. I don't know how to quite put it uh, in English. It's almost like something um, that you repeat, whether you know it or not. Can I have and, something here? Sure. Yeah. The thing about it is that, uh, you see, you don't wait until your hormones are taking over your body uh, in order to, to bring some, some, some ash quickly and make a circle <laughs> and then get some, you know, get the water in quickly uh, or something of that sort. Uh, no, uh, the, uh, you got to understand uh, what, what these elements mean. Uh, ash is the symbol of fire. That's what is usually utilized when any need of protection is expressed. Protection especially from uh, negative energies, even negative thought that may be passing by. Since uh, you know, it is the village belief, the thought usually lingered around. And when we vibrate harmoniously with those thoughts, we hit them. They, they come into us and they take over. So what happened is that attraction Attraction become intimidated in the ritual space. Something happened once you've used the, uh, the ash and made and pronounced the words that you told to pronounce while using the ash to make the circle. The intimate focus stopped being caused by sexual impulse and become channeled by spirit. So that whatever attraction you were feeling becomes something else. All of a sudden you realize that uh, you're involved in a situation that is a lot higher than who you are. And therefore, it is not going to be a context in which two people are being brought to interact. But there may be quite a few other people who are into the scene, uh, showing the road, guiding the way that uh, you need first to officially bring in. And that uh, invitation must first be expressed in terms of us being primarily enabled to carry anything sacred out by ourselves. Well, again, when I found out that we didn't have word for, uh, for sex, I realized that, in fact, it all come in, in a varieties of, of sentences. 
it's, it's usually about journey. It's about traveling. You want to go somewhere with someone else. You don't want to have sex with that person. Uh, you want to go somewhere. And usually that place is not known by you or by your partner. But at least you know someone that knows it. It's either the spirit of your dead uh, grandfather, your ancestors, uh, some kind of spirit that you have encountered in the course of some major ritual that you were involved with, uh, namely initiation. And so it's always important, uh, or necessary, mandatory, to call in that spirit to become like a horse on the back of which that journey can happen. It is that horse that is going to take you wherever it has plotted to take you to so that the learning or the vision that always comes in the context of intimacy, and that's the other aspect that needs to be emphasized. In an intimate situation, the visual horizon increases. There is no sense of confinement. There's even a postponement of anything pleasurable about it. It's more about a total uh, what you call, evaporation of the conscious eye and uh, jumping into a very dynamic collective space so that uh, somehow that intimate relationship is a microcosm of the intimate relationship between uh, the tribal community and its ancestors and between you as a person and the tribal community to which you belong. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Something like that. Uh, so that's, that's the part that uh, I wanted to, to make sure that uh, I get across because uh, in a lot of ways, this seems to, to be uh, the kind of ingredient that, uh, should I say, uh, it, keep, it keeps a, a, a mysterious veil around the whole thing. Any attempt at moving into that place by yourself or just by using the other's aesthetic invitation. You know what I mean? Uh, 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 somebody who's cut the proper way or something uh, uh, is in fact a lure. They say that evil spirit always cooked the kind of eyes that is likely to fall prey uh, to aesthetic delusion. And when you get caught into that, it is like eating an ice cream that has poison underneath it. So as you dig the first, the, the first cup, it will taste pretty good. The second one will taste pretty good. Then you forget. And the next sip becomes lethal. This is why kids from the beginning are always warned about the danger of jumping into this type of ritual space without prior guidance. Maybe that's what you may call civic education or something. Uh, but uh, uh, children are kind of taught to really look at that kind of journey with a lot of fear, uh, with a lot of trepidation because of the danger of not being able to return from where you get taken to. This is the reason why when an adolescent is ready to go to, to initiation, the reason why people know that he's ready to go is because uh, what is called here hormones, which don't have a word there for, uh, start to be experienced by the youth as a magnetic force that is pulling the child towards an unknown place. And so initiation becomes like a, a reversal of that process in the course of which this uh, ritual space is unveiled. I have carefully avoided talking about it in my book because uh, 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 you know what I mean. So uh, uh, anyway, let, let, let me stop it here. Uh,
I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about how pleasure and desire uh, relate to that whole question of calling in spirit and entering into the world of spirit. I thought that you said a little bit that what you called hormones or you know uh, answering what's in your body was largely a distraction or could be a distraction from from being able to fully call in spirit and enter the world of spirit and I certainly believe that that's possible but I also feel very strongly that that desire and pleasure in a way are spirit speaking in well, the body. Well in the village primarily uh, desire of this sort and its correlate nor namely lust are all uh, messages pumped into you from a spiritual source. So if you see that as uh, something that requires or drives you into disorderly conduct, that's where you spoil the invitation that spirit was actually implanting within you. The person who feels this kind of thrust is the person who needs to find out first where the source is. Not by looking at the, at the other gender with some thoughts, but by primarily becoming aware of the weaknesses that being locked on by spirit means. It doesn't mean that your hormone wants you to do something. It means primarily that something else is going on. And that's the part you need to listen to. This is why it's, it has to be looked at ritualistically. This desire is desire to be in a journey with spirit. It's like a horse that is coming and wants you to go somewhere. Now you got to find out where is that horse, uh, how is it configured, and what should I do in order to mount that horse or something of that sort. I, I feel also that uh, if you just try to aim at the pleasure only, it will be like um, something that is short you will get uh, finished with it in a, in a short time. But if you, you go beyond the pleasure and you look at it from the spiritual point of view and you deal with um, the fact that um, spirit is calling you and after you go beyond that, then the pleasure can come later on and it can be, um, I don't know how to say it, it can be something that you experience much, much uh, longer than you would if you were to focus only on the pleasure part. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, um, I'd like to ask a couple of questions about the community in terms of the uh, use of dreams in your culture, if there is uh, something of that sort, and also um, trance dancing, if you could mention it. What, what, what? Trance dancing or how dance is uh, part of your culture. Oh spiritually and also if dreams are used for any kind of spiritual communication? Well, a dream is primarily uh, uh, your true self. I said the part of yourself that is closed by the kind of body you carry that get the chance at least uh, to augment its circle of interaction at the time when you're no longer distracted by the magnetism of the immediate physical world. And therefore, if you don't dream, then something is deeply wrong with you. Dreams, therefore, are not looked at from a strictly Freudian standpoint, but uh, as the other way of tapping into either something that is happening around you or something that is heading your way, that is say, something that will happen. And therefore, it is, it, it is a very good place for someone to find answers to questions that uh, that person wouldn't normally find. This is why when you ask someone a question, and that person can't an answer it. You say, well, uh, let me go sleep on it. What it means is actually it's going to dream. It's going to dream that question. And after a couple of nights, the answer may be there. So dancing, dancing is also something that has a very uh, ritualistic uh, uh, meaning around it. We don't just communicate with the mouth. You see. Uh, somehow, uh, our whole apparatus either communication device. And using the body to communicate has a very cleansing effect on the person who is doing that. It is the first time where you are given the opportunity to stop using the upper region of yourself, that is the mind, to control you in a way that uh, is predictable. 
if someone dances truly, that person is in trance. In other words, uh, you are out of the ordinary, or you are somewhere else, something. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that you cannot be thinking about uh, your foot being lifted and put down while you're dancing, or you lose it. It's just like drumming. I can't be thinking about what my hands are doing, or I'm not drumming. If you want to call that trance dance, yeah, the, but in the village they call it just dance. Yeah, uh, <laughs> dance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for coming tonight and speaking with us. I want to ask about gender questions. I pretty much live as a lesbian, and I'd like to know if there are people in your village who, are, who feel called to people of the same gender, if you ever have two people of the same gender who are married, how you deal with these issues. What you call again, uh, it's a matter of wording again. Yeah. We don't have a word for lesbian or gay in the village. What I understand from what the elder said is when somebody has uh, uh, gone through some kind of magnetic field, sometimes there is a shift in, uh, in the person. Usually the person enters into a gateway, something like that. And uh, if uh, something isn't done ritualistically to take care of the person, then the person feel attracted to uh, the person of the same sex. I don't know if I'm making sense. And, uh, but uh, usually what you refer to here as a gays and lesbian, in the village, uh, they are called gatekeepers. I don't know if you want to add something to that. Well, the thing you have to know is that uh, uh, the same social claims that are coming from gay community here don't exist in the village. Uh, the, word, the word gay uh, does not either, but there's the word gatekeeper. And these people are given a context in which they live, they, they live a life that is purely about gatekeeping and being with one another in a way that is consistent with the kind of task that they're playing in the village, the kind of mission that they're fulfilling in the village. They're not asking it from the village, they're just doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there isn't any rule or regulation that prevents them from being together, or there isn't any rule or regulation that, that, that tells them not to be with one another. They just do it. Uh, so. What I know at least is that periodically, every year, the gatekeepers disappear into nature. They have to do that as part of their mission in the tribe. What they do, they don't like to communicate that to anybody. It is their right to keep what they do there to themselves. So, uh, hey, uh, we've got everybody to respect that simply because without them, there's no other world that anybody can access. They are the gatekeepers. And, and do people live in couples? What? And, and do the gatekeepers live in couples? Again, it is their prerogative. They don't, you know, they don't masquerade that in the village. But they certainly do. Not in the, in the linear way that uh, uh, couples are looked at in the West. But uh, in the context of the kind of work that they do. Each time I ask them the question, they say, we are gatekeepers. And so I've come to understand that uh, that means I have access to anything I want. <laughs> well, at some point, uh, you know. Uh, do they also use the ash circle to come together intimately? They do. Uh, apparently, when they, they, they gather, the only time I've seen the two of them work together, they yell at each other pretty badly. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know whether they were mad at each other, but they always talk very loud. Uh, maybe because of the, the because they, it was all happening around a cave, and and therefore maybe uh, they needed to shout at each other in order to make sense to the other world, something like that. But uh, it sounded very unusual to me. Usually at the at the gate, uh, the the language is very low, and uh, uh, it was I didn't understand why uh, two people who are uh, both called gatekeeper coming together to work. Uh, we'll be talking out so loud or something. Thank you. Thank you. 
in the Degara culture, is uh, sex outside of marriage, premarital sex, as we would call it, permissible? Do couples, do individuals? Well, outside of marriage, you mean yeah. of the type that I, I talked about earlier, meaning that two people are married and then they have sex outside of the marriage? No, I mean before. two people before their marriage. Oh. Is that uh, allowable? Uh, usually in the village, uh, because you, you usually don't choose your partner, I haven't personally experienced this kind of uh, a relationship. What uh, I know is that people look at each other primarily as individual, not as a sexual attraction. Uh, it's hard to, uh, to say whether that truly happened uh, or not because of the fact that prior to, uh, as soon as you start developing any sign of sexual maturity, you become the center of initiation interest. As if uh, initiation is gonna cure you from your potential lust or something. Uh, and, uh, and as soon as you get out of initiation, you have a partner. And so uh, uh, prior to that, well, uh, without uh, the proper equipment, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to think about, uh, to conceive of sex prior to marriage. But the modern world, of course, had started advertising uh, different opportunities. And so uh, people either uh, turn their back to initiation and become mature, and they, they hear from others who, are, who have come back from the cities of readily available sexual uh, uh, exploration in the city. So uh, that's part of the reason for the rural ex exodus. But in the village, uh, Jesus, uh, if the whole idea, I'm trying to think in terms of what would happen if that were to occur in a given family. My God. Uh, what, what age is initiation? Uh, it's um, in, in teens, between, um, it depends on uh, if it's a boy or a girl. Some um, girl is, uh, is start at 10, they, they have their period at 10. But um, the normal age is between uh, um, 11 and 15. I have two quick questions. One question is the question of polygamy in most African societies and how relationships are developed in those settings under polygyny and, and polyandry. And also is that there's a lot of uh, influence of, of media on, on sex and intimacy in this culture. I know that a lot of that is having an impact on other societies. And I'm sure there's a lot more of Western uh, media being placed in, in African countries as opposed to what's coming from Africa here. And could you talk about the impact of media on relationships as well? Uh, I forgot um, the question. Yeah. <laughs> in our village, how do you say, polygamy is allowed but it's up to uh, the woman to choose whether she wants another partner or not. I know at least um, my uh, aunt, she chose to have several other women with her. And uh, uh, she talked to her husband about it. And uh, that is that what she got? It's not seen as something that is um, uh, perverted or something like that, but it's, uh, it's more of the um, reaction of uh, a woman who feels happy in her relationship and wants to bring other women to share that happiness with herself. So. Well, I know it's probably pretty hard to take. Uh, it's a hard piece <laughs> because uh, any relationship that is uh, linked to ownership uh, will find itself pretty allergic to this kind of concept. But uh, at least in the tribe, uh, the, the existence of polygamy is determined by women, not by men. You don't go around uh, uh, trying to look for more wives to bring to your, to your house. Because uh, once the first marriage occurred, the second one is no longer a matter of family, if it is you that decides to do it. But if it is a wife, your, your wife, they call, they will call her by a certain, by a certain name. Uh, some, she becomes an elder immediately. As soon as she authorizes another person to come, and it's always about uh, family, uh, 
family cohesion. It's about compound. It's about having someone to talk to while she's doing her thing. Uh, having her women quarter uh, become more lively or something of that sort. But uh, the, the other way around, I don't know what you call uh, polyandry. Uh, I don't know exactly what that means. Uh, uh, it means... Uh, polyandry? Uh, yeah, a woman it's, having... It's when a woman has more than one husband. Oh, gee, that, that's completely inconceivable because uh, uh, m having more than one husband means uh, that... M because, wait a minute. See, when... <laughs> see... When we were married, you know, I'm supposed to take her name, and the house we formed carried her name, and the children carried her name. Now, that compound's identity would start to dwindle if she, if she has to, uh, uh, to go with another man somewhere. The other way around is completely, uh, because a house is, is, a, is the, that's a place of, uh, of woman. Not that she stays there, but because everybody's identity is associated with the mother. Yeah. And could you respond uh, to the other question around, uh, around media and the impact of media on relationships in your, in your uh, culture? We don't, we, um, well, I the, don't know. the impact of media is the same as everywhere else. The, uh, the, the emptying, the gradual emptying of the village, of its population. And as a result, the import of all these new ideas pertaining to romance, pertaining to uh, the individual, the I and the my, you know, this is my thing, this is me, and so forth. This has started to happen as a result of people going to the city and coming back. You see, most of the time, you know, when I arrive in the village, I have a suitcase full of clothes. I can leave, that, I can leave the suitcase and wear something, and then I go to the, to the, to the bar nearby, sit there, and then somebody comes in and greets me, and I realize he's wearing my, my shoes, my, my shirt. <laughs> it means that, you know, the, the person who hasn't been to the city still don't realize that the I and the my is very important. And, uh, you know, he, he comes near a suitcase, and there's a lot of clothes, and he's wearing rugged stuff, so he just changed his clothes. See, that has always been a problem for, uh, with me, but uh, this, <laughs> well, I always managed to go home with a little closer so that, uh, 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 I guess I always gonna come back with an empty I, uh, And it's the same thing when you refer to somebody as your husband. For instance, in the village, I wouldn't refer to my Lidoma as my husband, but my sisters will refer to him as their husband, and I will refer to my sister's husband as my husband. So if you hear somebody say, uh, 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 honey, uh, and you think that that's what it is, you fool. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, the real honey is somewhere else. Uh, uh, all right, they say. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I feel disadvantaged in two ways when I listen to the ritual inside the circle of ash. You tell me that there is a private, public thing going on. Mm -hmm. What that means to me is that there are a whole history of ancestors with you mm -hmm. from an unbroken chain. Yeah. Um, and I feel deprived when I hear that because I don't even know what my grand, great grandfather did when he was here. Mm. So I don't even know what name to call him or anything like that. Now, what that means then is that I don't have a guide to go on this journey, even if I went on it. You do, you do. Uh, one I mis thing you have and to. And I misunderstand. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. What, what usually we refer by ancestors, um, what I've noticed is that people uh, tend to immediately refer to their immediate ancestors. And uh, it's sometimes difficult, as you said, you don't know your grandfather. But there is what we call the pool of the ancestors. It doesn't have to be a person. It can be the tree out there. It can be um, the uh, cows out there. And so if you put an immediate 
feeling to your immediate family can be, it can bring some bad feeling, I should say. You cannot personalize or custom made ancestors for yourself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because then that leads to confusion. <laughs> yeah, uh, confusion is what, what is I important feel. is to realize that any person who has lost the physical body is a potential ancestor. And by simply uh, expressing your longing for ancestry, you are attracting a lot of spirits around you. Ignore who your great-great-grandfather was, because he probably just has joined the, 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 this great ensemble of ancestors to the point where you can't even identify. You can't, he's, probably the, the, he's probably the creek running down the, over there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, if, you, if you want to give him a face, it's like, I can't remember you unless I see you in that clothes, you know. And so they want to be left spirit, as spirit, not with a body. And if you just refer to them, especially even say that, you know, the, the ones that I know the, and the one that I don't know. But the, those that know me more than I do myself. Already you are putting the power over there. And you're not beginning, by, uh, beginning with this, this confusion as to whether uh, in the museum of ancestry there's one sitting somewhere that you can associate with. You know, you know just, associate, just do random relationship in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> you spoke about a woman being able to bring in other women as part of the marriage. Uh, what about multi-person relationships where um, there may be, say for instance, three women and any number of men, um, <laughs> and I'm wondering how in your culture is there a place where people who have perhaps a similarity of spirit where there's more than two and they can create a relationship and this is my definition. Oh, you're talking about uh, this kind of relationship that is not necessarily uh, articulated within a marital, a marital context. One way to look at it is just the fact that uh, if you understand what kind of things happen in collective rituals, mm -hmm. and you can understand the village as a place where everybody in it is addicted to ritual, <laughs> then your question gets answered naturally because uh, it is no longer about moving from the I to the others, but it's moving from the, from the many all the way back to the self. And so what happened here is that the relationship that we, talk, we started out talking about, this kind of intimacy we started out talking about, is one that people experience not just with their partners, but with the rest of the village mm -hmm. at all times, simply because of the repeated involvement with ritual. Every time there's such a high that most, most dialogues that are going on are about a ritual that just ended or about the need, the insuperable need for a ritual to happen now, you see. And so, well, you know, you're dealing with a, with a bunch of people. Maybe that's why they don't care about TV and so forth, because they have enough stuff, you know. Uh, but they need to be constantly involved in ritual. Because it's like an energy that gives a high in you that lasts perhaps three, four days, and as soon as you start wearing down, everybody's concerned. They need the high again. You know? So once you have been in it over and over and over, what happens is that it takes care of uh, this need for collective uh, involvement, and you know that you gain something constantly when you are involved with other people in this high space called ritual space. There's one last thing that I want you to know. Uh, 
we've been uh, we've been supporting our elders for as long as we've been here because it's thanks to us that uh, they and their families can still stay together the youth in the village are leaving the land is almost dead drought is really bad i just got a letter this afternoon uh, they're saying that uh, the creek, which is four miles away, where women go and get the gallons of water to take back home, is also dry. So uh, in trying to respond to that, you know, we've, we've started thinking that, well, any person who values the, 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 these people must do something to, uh, uh, to help them. Uh, there's got to be a way in which appreciation of these values can lead to some kind of helping hand uh, given to these people so that at least uh, uh, they can have something. Uh, for that, we've created something called Echoes of the Ancestors, and inside of which there's, there is uh, a brochure that we put together which is called Friends of the Dagara. Its purpose is eventually to appeal to those of you who want to see these old women not have to walk four miles to get a bucket of water. We want to be able at least to dig a well or two somewhere central so that everybody can go get the water from there. Uh, we want to be able at least to retain the torrential water that falls during the, uh, the rainy season so that, so that at least uh, there be a little more greenness, of, uh, that the land can be revived. And maybe that will stop the rural exodus. So that's, uh, that's just what I wanted to add before we pray to the ancestor. Uh, we want to thank them for... Uh, having been with us in the course of this time. Whatever has come out uh, wouldn't probably have come out if they weren't here to at least stir us to do it. So uh, we just want you to join us and we'll, we'll do an invocation in the native language and uh, you can follow with your own heart. <laughs> Yer won tani yer maro. Ti puriana barka. Ti zeli. Ka yi kyan benin ti ya. Ka ti bekinu tuan yi vla. A ti zye. Na neve bala zye. Ti man kyena. Ka kyan lan. Yen bo ka ti man ter. O tuan be a ti zye. Ka ti man tuan yi ku luar. A neve zye. A bibye za po. Ka vla. Ti mbo. Na yer maro ti mbo. Tuan bebe. Kura kura le. I'm in bed and I'm lamming here and Kabun Nabi. I'm in bed and I'm not there, man. Kabarana. My baby, Luella Kakana and Deme. I'm say so. Nihere Anna Nabara Mike Akabara Lu. Olo, I'm baby Nafu. Aniche, Ani Baraji. I am the me, a family me. I am the Sudia. I am the barefoot Kadwan Clora. Mbafu, Aniche, Ani Baraji. I am the man Kasiso. I am the man Kasiso. I am the man Kasiso. Aniche, Ani Baraji. Let's all say Barka. Barka. Let's say it again. Barka. Again. Barka. That means thank you. <laughs> You are listening to We Have No Word for Sex, an indigenous view of intimacy, with Maladoma and Sabonfu Somme. In a subsequent conversation, Sabonfu elaborated on parenting, community, and the kinds of knowledge Dagara women received during initiation. Uh, during initiation, you go through uh, this learning process about, uh, you know, sex and... Uh, all this intimacy thing, otherwise how would you know? <laughs> no, this is what I was, I was wondering. And uh, even after initiation, you are still being coached. If you think there is something you're not grasping, you know, you can always turn to the elders. And I guess that's what the mentoring thing is about after initiation, so you can really uh, have a knowledge, a full knowledge, instead of uh, having some kind of illusionary knowledge. 
there is a session during initiation where you are taught about all the sexual thing, you know, um, you know, like with your period, why you have your period, like at the last conference we were talking about um, the connection of the uh, menstrual blood to the ancestors. The relationship of your menstrual blood to the moon also and all the uh, uh, interdimensional things that happen. I, I don't know exactly how to explain it in English, but uh, the basic idea is that when a woman is going through her menstrual period, she's channeling powerful energies from the, from the land of the ancestors. And there have to be people around to contain that. Otherwise, the energy just uh, goes out to waste. And so women uh, who would be doing ritual for the woman, whatever the woman who has the period choice is, contain that energy to ground the knowledge. For instance, if you channel something about uh, the underworld, what's happening and what is needed, for instance, here, that somebody is there to catch that because some people can go into trance while they have their um, menstrual um, their period, you should, I should say. So uh, um, they, when they speak, that there is somebody around at least to uh, catch that moment. And after that, they can uh, check with the elders to see what's happening. It has to happen in a ritual space. And uh, given the fact that it is a um, powerful moment for the woman, she can be outside also, but it depends on what she chooses to, to do. You know, uh, some women will say, okay, I want to be carried to the place of a village and have people sing and dance and rock me and so forth. You know, so uh, it depends on the choice of a woman. It, it's not uh, something that, uh, you know, it's restricted. And um, uh, both men and women, they, uh, she can ask them to do whatever she wants. Because uh, having your period is considered something uh, not only sec uh, sacred, but it's all also uh, uh, a powerful moment for the person. So you cannot just uh, repress her. She is very much accepted in the village. Are there any taboos about uh, engaging in sexual relations during that time? Uh, yes, during that time, usually women don't uh, love to have. Uh, they don't want to have sex with men because. Um, if the man isn't at the same level, it can be really um, detrimental, or how you say that in English. It can, it can do something to him that, that will disempower him or something like that. So when a woman says no, uh, the man understand what's happening. Uh -huh. Well, it sounds like there's a, an incredible amount of support from the village around various aspects of the of the marriage, mm -hmm. an ongoing support. Oh yes, definitely, and it's uh, it's uh, like every part of every day's life, like waking up in the morning, walking to somebody and sitting and say, "Well, last night I didn't sleep well." So the person say, "Oh, uh, so what happened in your sleep?" So you tell the thing. It's like it's not like okay, you have to have a specific time to do. It's like a a um, a life. It's part of very life. Natural. Yeah, it's very natural. So you ask these questions and you just get counseling and so forth. You spoke during the talk of the importance of the, the men having the men's compound to go to, mm -hmm. to sleep. Mm -hmm. And the women go back always to the women's compound. Mm -hmm. um, where do the children fit into this? Uh, the children uh, love to sleep wherever they feel like it, so they, don't, they are not restricted, at least uh, till they start to be, become uh, adolescent. They are free to choose wherever they want to sleep. So they can sleep with the women today, if they choose they move to the men's quarter or sleep with a grandfather, grandmother, wherever they feel like it, so they're not restricted. It sounds like a lot more freedom of, for the children to not necessarily always be with their their own mother and their own father. Yeah, I don't know uh, how to explain it, but the child belongs to the uh, whole village. And so uh, from birth, as soon as you're born, your mother is not the only one who is responsible for you. Anybody else can uh, feed the child. Once a woman has a, a rich, what you call the crone uh, age he, he, here, she can nurture any other child. 
if another woman has a baby, she can nurture, uh, uh, feed that child. She can nurse that. Yeah, she can breastfeed that child, and it's perfectly all right. You have a lot of people taking care of that child, and sometimes you want to see your child so bad because, you know, after you spend those few days inside after the birth of a uh, baby, after that, you don't know who, who, where the child is anymore. I remember I used to do that trick with my sisters all the time. I, uh, I would go and get the children and disappear with them for days, and they would be wondering where the kids are, you know. And so they have, uh, everybody has their mother and everybody has their father, so they just choose whoever they want for the day to be their dad or for the second for their dad. So it's perfectly all right. That's an astounding difference from what, what we call the nuclear family here. Mm -hmm. And the children, in a sense, are isolated, having only mom and dad to depend on. And maybe this is where so much of the dissatisfaction mm -hmm. with our, our parents and our, and our families and our marriages have come from, is because we're expecting too much from one or two people. That's definitely true, because uh, the child grows up with this mentality, okay, I have only one father and one mother, and so any problem I have, if they cannot fix it, then I don't have anybody else to turn to, and so they're responsible for whoever I become. It's uh, a little bit too much to ask of uh, just uh, two people, and uh, sometimes one person, even the uh, person is a single parent. And so uh, I think at least having this broad motherhood, fatherhood thing helps the child not to blame one person. Because if you go to uh, one person and the person cannot fix your problem, you just turn your back and you go to somebody else. And that person will be able to give you some advice. And if that isn't enough, you go to somebody else. So you have so many people to choose from and to do things with that you, you don't have to focus on just one person. And, you know, being in a human form, you are obviously restricted to what you can do or give. Yeah, so you definitely, is that right? So you definitely need other people in order to support you. It's like what we say in the village, it takes a whole village to raise a child. Or if you want, you can say, it takes a whole village to make a, two couples sane when they have a child. When you, are, you have children and all you, you can do is just the two of you to take care of them, then it doesn't give you much time for you two to actually work out whatever is going between you two. And so it piles up, it piles up. And when the children are gone, then you suddenly realize that there is this mountain of things that has not been dealt with for years. And so you start to dig in. And when you cannot do it, I've noticed that a lot of people do divorce after the children leave home. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that might be one of the cause for that. Do you see any hope for change? Uh, do you have any feelings about ways that we could move toward a more sane family structure or relationship structure? Well, the only thing I, I see at this point is uh, community. Um, building communities where you can trust each other, where you can uh, you know, you can intervene to a mother who is crying because she has a, a child who is crying and she doesn't know what to give to him or her, that we, uh, we are able to build this kind of community. You know, in the village, when you get up, the first thing you do is to go outside. But here, one day I was sitting all day inside without getting out, and uh, it suddenly occurred to me, this is the first time I've ever done that except when I, was, uh, I wasn't feeling well back home. But to get up in the morning and not to go out is absolutely inconceivable to somebody in the village. Because uh, when you stay all day inside, it means that something isn't going right with you and people start to worry about you. And so uh, going outside, trying to talk to your neighbors, of course it's difficult when everybody else is uh, going to work, but uh, meeting your neighbors and uh, trying to uh, make some kind of community where you can uh, have other people, kids, if you stay in home and so forth, and, you know, helping each other out. Maybe then it's only small steps like that. Yeah, it's a, st a small step like this. It's like uh, what we say. 
when you have a, a baby, you don't throw her away uh, because she's little, but you keep her and uh, keep nurturing her, knowing that one day she's going to be a grown-up. So uh, those, those are the kind of small things that you put them together slowly, and one day uh, this uh, thought about community can happen. Perhaps we have to give up such a strong sense of the individual. And it seems to me we're very jealously protecting our right. Something we don't even have, that, we, that, that it's an illusion. In the village, uh, people cannot think that just Mali Doma and I can be living in a house. It's completely inconceivable because we are like a whole house, and I said it's really big compared to the houses we have uh, in the village where people live. It's really huge. I see we have this huge house, and it's just Mali Doma and I. I mean, when I first said, my mother just grabbed her head and said, Why are you doing this for? I said, what? Because they, everybody have their place and, you know. There's no village to go that's to. That's why there's, uh, there's no village to go to. There's not, uh, no family where you live. So I told her, well, you might want to come and live with me. She said, no, not under this condition. <laughs> so what, one of the problems, it sounds like, is, is that it's, it's not only uh, th these illusions that, uh, that we are individuals, that we are independent of others, that we are independent of the ancestors. But out of that, we've created an architecture That's right. that forbids a village existence. Part of it is an architectural problem. That's right. That's right. And there needs to be some other change. We can't just go off and create an African village. We're carrying the culture with us or something. Yeah, there has to be, ritual has to be at the base of it. After ritual, you have to be uh, completely um, indifferent from the financial uh, thing. Because the finances are going to keep you still working and it's not going to uh, make it uh, happen. Because everybody is going to work who is in charge uh, with uh, money in this community. Because being in, in control, financially in control, you control everything. Is that what it means in this culture? Uh, I don't know if I'm making sense to you. So the economic situation sets up a, a power structure and yes. a power battle. That's right. That, that's that right. basically disallows. That's community. right. That's right. Because it, it creates uh, some kind of imbalance. And uh, when you don't have money, then you are at the bottom. Which uh, in the village we don't have. There isn't anything. Well, the only monetary thing we have is curry shells, you know. You just, uh, or you trade with things. You know, I have a millet, uh, I want uh, your bean, I give you the millet and I get it, or I just simply go and get it. And so uh, economic uh, is uh, one of the uh, things that defeats the creation of a uh, community in this culture. So again, I, I keep sensing this beauty of, of the system you're talking about, which we probably idealize because mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. our nature. We're seeing it. We're not living in it. Mm -hmm. And then there's these obstacles, the spiritual, economic, and the architectural obstacles, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which are feel almost insurmountable. That's right. If, again, if I think I'm an individual who has to make this change, mm -hmm. I'm hopeless. But I, when you talk about ritual or talk about the ancestors, perhaps someone else is planning something for us and what we need to do is just sort of tune in or something. Yes, yes, yes. Instead of think that we know how to do it. Yes. You know, it's going to be pretty hard to have a model of the uh, Agra tribe or the African way of living. But it's uh, more about uh, making some kind of balance with this too where people don't feel completely like they're rejected from the society or something like that. But making some kind of compromise that will keep uh, the community there and yet still have a little part in, in the society. Uh, in closing, uh, is there anything that you would like to say about men and women in relationship and how they can move toward a more sacred sense of intimacy? What I, I see happening, at least for uh, those who are interested in uh, uh, having a, um, an easier relationship, I would say uh, focusing more on rituals and also listening more to the ancestors 
uh, with trees, with uh, dog, and so forth, listening to uh, these forces who come and speak to us, and uh, that we uh, who we usually ignore. You have been listening to We Have No Word for Sex, an indigenous view of intimacy, with Maladoma and Sabonfu Somme, produced by Oral Tradition Archives. To order this tape or for a free catalog of oral tradition recordings, call us toll-free at 1-800-779-1116 or write to us at postbox 51155, Pacific Grove, California, 93950. Information about the Friends of the Dagara Water Restoration Project, mentioned earlier, may also be obtained through oral tradition. Once again, our address is Postbox 51155, Pacific Grove, California, 93950, and our phone, 1-800-779-1116. This is Rick Shalhoub. Thank you for listening.